Good afternoon. Jimmy here in Chicago. Hope everybody's enjoying their weekend. Sunday, fun day, my favorite day of the week. Get ready to watch game seven of the New York Knicks and Indiana Pacers. Even though the Knicks are down a few guys, I think they're going to pull it off at home. They're pretty tough to beat. And then tonight, the game I'm really looking forward to is Minnesota is playing the defending champions, Denver Nuggets, in Denver. If I bet on the game, I would probably bet Denver to win it, but I'm hoping Minnesota can pull off the upset. So I like Minnesota and probably Boston in the NBA Finals. And then in the Stanley Cup, you got a great series coming up with the Florida Panthers and the New York Rangers. That's pretty much a coin toss. And then on the West, you've got Dallas Stars. They're going to play the winner of Game 7 tomorrow, the Vancouver Canucks or Edmonton Oilers. I'm going to go with Florida Panthers and the Dallas Stars in the Cup. What do you guys like? But if you like my Chicago Mob Trial stories, please hit the like button, subscribe, share with your friends. If you have any ideas for upcoming shows, please enter them into the comments. Today I got a short story. We're going to talk about a contract that was given but actually never got carried out. Usually when a Chicago mob boss gives the green light on somebody, it's just a matter of time before they actually get to him and kill him. But sometimes the contract doesn't get carried out for a lot of different reasons. It reminds me of uh, going back in, the, I think, late 80s, early 1990s, corrupt cop chief of the Willow Springs Police Department, Michael Corbett. Joe Lombardo, boss of the Grand Avenue crew, gave out that contract to have Michael Corbett killed. I believe that contract was uh, given out to Scalise out of the Wild Bunch crew. But for some reason, Scalise never got a chance to kill Corbett. I think what happened was Michael Corbett got pinched. He was part of the uh, conspiracy to kill uh, scumbag lowlife lawyer Alan Masters' wife, Diane Masters. He uh, cooperated, admitted to his role in the crime, that he actually drove the car with her dead body in the trunk of that car. He drove it from a bar in Justice, Illinois, right across from Resurrection Mary, Mary Cemetery, Chets. He drove that a short distance and dumped it in the canal in Willow Springs. Michael Corbett, Alan Masters, and a corrupt Cook County Sheriff all were found guilty of killing Diane Masters. But I bring this up because Joy Lombardo gave the contract to have Michael Corbett killed, but that never happened. Corbett did some time in prison, snitched, ratted on all his associates and friends in organized crime. You could read the book, Double Deal. It's a pretty good book, but uh, it's embellished a little bit. I also did a story about all the corruption that went on in Willow Springs. But today's story is a good one. We're going to talk about a contract that was put on Nick Calabrese's life that luckily for Nicky, it never got carried out. Now, here we got boss of the 26th Street crew. Angelo the Bull, the Hook, whatever you want to call him, La Petria. And it came out in the Family Secrets trial that there were a lot of differences between the crews. For example, the Taylor Street crew, they called the Wild Bunch. Their MO, when they got a green light on a guy, after tailing him for a few weeks or a few months, they would ambush him, ski masks, shotguns, 
and blow the guy away right there, broad daylight, right in front of witnesses, New York style. Then you had the Grand Avenue crew, where I'm from. That was the smallest crew, the most quietest crew, led by Joe Lombardo, Kozo, Mikey Switek for a little while. The Grand Avenue crew, that crew was best known for burglaries, robberies. They had some of the best thieves, burglars in North America. Then you had the Northside crew, DeFranzo's crew. They were the money crew. They stopped using violence. They went more legit, invested in construction, real estate bars, restaurants, nightclubs, cafes, strip clubs, shopping malls. The Northside crew was the money crew. They made all the money. And a lot of guys were jealous of the Northside crew because they had nicer cars, they dressed nicer, they went on more vacations, they were making more money. They also said that the Chinatown crew, the 26th Street crew, Angelo's crew, was the best killing crew. If they had a, an important target that the mob had a hit, most likely they gave that contract to the 26th Street crew because they knew it would get carried out. If other crews were having a hard time killing a guy, they would pivot, give it to the Chinatown crew, and they would get the job done. But they were led by this, this monster here, Angelo, the bull, Lapetria. He eventually got pinched with Iupa, Joe Lombardo, Jack Cerrone, a couple guys from Kansas City during the straw man indictment. That's where they charged these gentlemen in conspiracy to skim millions of dollars from four mobbed up hotel and casinos in Vegas. You all know that story. But Angela LaPetria told his brother Jimmy LaPetria that we should have did something about the Calabrese brothers years ago. And what he meant by that was, A, they should have killed them both or one of the two. Or they should have shelved them or broke them up. And this guy actually, he had vision. He was right about the Calabrese brothers because eventually we all know what happened. Junior testified against his own father, his own uncle, and then Nick Calabrese flipped and testified to 14 murders that him and his brother and other outfit guys were involved in. Now it all started with the bloody glove. We all know the story where when Nick Calabrese killed his best friend, John Fecarata, during the chase, he dropped one of the black leather gloves that he was wearing. The cops found this glove and put it into evidence for years. This sat in the basement of the... Cook County Court Building right there on 26th in California, right next to the jail for years. Fast forward 2005, we all know what happened. Junior Calabrese wrote a letter to the FBI informing the agents that he wanted to cooperate and help convict his father and send him to prison for life. Junior claims he had no intention of bringing down the entire Chicago outfit, but that's complete bullshit. He knew damn well by whom cooperating that it would indeed have a ripple effect on other, other heavyweights in Chicago outfit. Guys like Lombardo, Jimmy, Cal uh, Jimmy Marcello, and others. So fast forward mid-2000s. The FBI went around to all the federal prisons where Chicago outfit guys were locked up, and they swabbed every one of them for DNA.
one man matched, one man's DNA matched to that glove, and that was Nick Calabrese. Nick Calabrese was locked up, as we know, in Milan, Michigan. I think he did some time in Pekin when the Calabrese crew got indicted. Nick Calabrese had no intention of flipping or cooperating. When the feds came to him, they told him it was your DNA that matched. That was a match on the glove that was found at the Fecarata crime scene. They basically had him for that murder. But at first, Nick Calabrese had nothing to say to the agents. He slept on it. The next day, the agents came back to visit him. But this time, they threatened him with the electric chair. And for some reason, that scared Nick Calabrese. He decided to flip and cooperate. Fast forward, this was evidence they showed at the trial. These are prison tapes of two corrupt cops. The guy sitting next to Frank Calabrese was Michael Ricci. He was a high-ranking Cook County Sheriff. And then he had Chicago cop, Chicago outfit associate, Anthony Chuan Doyle. Both of these men were defendants at the Family Secrets trial. Chuan was eventually found guilty. And Michael Ricci was, um, I think he died before the Family Secrets trial started. But he would have been convicted as well. Now, in this tape, Frank Calabrese, who was a master at talking in code, he actually bragged that he was the first one to come up with code talk. <laughs> his code was so elaborate and unique that sometimes his son and other outfit guys had a hard time following him. That's what Chuan said. Chuan said when he testified that he had no idea what Frank Calabrese was talking about. He was just going along with him. But you could tell by this photo here that Chuan is locked in. He's paying very close attention to what Calabrese is saying. And in one of these conversations, Frank Calabrese got word from Ricci and Chuan that they got to Nick Calabrese and he's going to cooperate. Obviously, Frankie Calabrese was concerned because he knows all the murders that he participated in with his brother. So they're talking in code about talking about his sister, meaning his brother, Frank Calab Nick Calabrese, that my sister is very sick and she needs to go see a doctor. What he's saying there, because he was talking opposite genders, that his brother is flipping, and something's got to be done about this. And then Chuan Doyle makes the smart-ass comment that, yeah, I think she needs some shock therapy. And they all start laughing. It'd be interesting to see the transcripts because there's a lot more about these tapes where they were talking in code. If you guys know where to get the transcripts from some of these trials, please let me know. Please enter in the comments. I'm sure the viewers would like to read those as well. But basically, Frank Calabrese is letting these two corrupt cops who are associates of Chicago Outfit, letting them know that he wants his brother clipped. And he references the curly girl. What he was talking about, he was referring to boss of Chicago Outfit at the time, Frankie Toots Caruso. He wanted word to get back to Caruso that Nick Calabrese is cooperating, can bring a lot of people down. And Frank was okay with that. During another prison visit, Nicky Calabrese, a kid I knew from the Merck and from some of the nightclubs back in the 90s, he was one of the defendants at the Family Secret Trial as well, but he was smart. He kept his mouth shut. He listened to his lawyers. He did a couple of years in prison. Was released to a halfway house, paid a hefty fine. Now he's home back with his family, working a legitimate job. 
A lot of people like Scott Bernstein and Adam and Red say he's the boss of Chicago Alpha. That's complete bullshit. Nikki's mob days are completely over. But he would use the ruse saying he was Nick Calab Frank Calabrese's godson. That allowed Frank Calabrese to have him on his visitors list. So when Nikki would go visit Frank Calabrese Sr. in prison, they would talk in code. And Nikki told them the hundreds of thousands of dollars he was making with their book operation. Frank Calabrese warned them not to talk about large amounts of cash like that. I don't remember the amount, but it was unbelievable. It was like a couple hundred thousand a month. He literally had a multi-million dollar book operation. And keep in mind, he worked at the Merck. You can imagine the gambling going on at the Merck and the Board of Trade. But during that prison visit, Frank Calabrese was telling a young Nick Ferriola that according to the Bible, it's okay to kill your brother if he betrays you. And Nick Calabrese responded, wow. Like he was shocked that Nick Calabrese is going to cooperate and flip. He was also surprised that it says if you betray your brother, you could kill your brother in the Bible. But those were pretty interesting um, visits when you had Nicky Calabrese or Nicky Ferriola, Junior Calabrese, Anthony Twan Doyle, Michael Ricci, all visiting Frank Calabrese in prison talking in code. Now here's Nick Calabrese. I've seen him every single day testify in court. I think he was on the stand at least two weeks, probably seven to ten days. He went into great detail on 14 unsolved murders dating back to 1974. He also gave the government information on a dozen or so other murders that were unsolved where the government had no idea uh, who was involved. I think Nick Calabrese was the only made guy, made member of Chicago Alpha that ever testified. And it just makes me sick because why they were locked up together, he was complaining to Jimmy Marcello how his brother was, wasn't treating him right. He was abusing him, not paying him for all the work he's done, bullying him, threatening him. So Jimmy Marcel, Jimmy Marcello offered that when they get out of the can, he wanted Nikki to come work with him and his crew, and he'd be taken care of. Jimmy Marcello immediately had his brother Mikey Marcello start dropping off three to five thousand dollars every month to Nick Calabrese's wife. Jimmy Marcello and Nick testified to this. Jimmy Marcello took care of Nick Calabrese's family while Nick Calabrese was away. His brother and no other members of the 26th Street crew of Chicago outfit did anything at all to help Nick and his family. Jimmy Marcello was the only one. Jimmy Marcello, in conversations with his brother, Mikey Marcello, wasn't too concerned about Nick flipping initially because he considered all that payments he was given to Nicky's wife was a good insurance policy. And Mikey Marcello tells him, I hope that works out for you, buddy. But Mikey Marcello was right. Nick Calabrese decided to flip and cooperate. Jimmy Marcello underestimated Nick Cal Calabrese. He trusted him. But that's what kind of coward Nick Calabrese was. Even though Jimmy Marcello helped him and his family, Nick Calabrese still flipped, snitched, and lied about Jimmy Marcello. At first, when they talked about the Splatchero brother murders, Nick Calabrese left Jimmy Marcello out of it. He said it was John Thakarada and Jimmy LaPetria that picked him up at the Venture parking lot and dropped him off at the house in Bensonville. Later that night, 
He slept on it. Nick said he wanted to come clean with the agents. So then he told him the truth, that it was Jimmy Marcello that picked him up and dropped him off at the Spatra Brothers. He also said Jimmy Marcello gave him an Uzi and two grenades to take a train out to Nevada to kill the Spatra Brothers. He testified that Jimmy Marcello and him personally um, jumped and strangled a couple guys during the Strangers in the Night murder. But fast forward back to the prison tapes. Mikey Marcello is talking in code about the indictment that just came down, giving Jimmy Marcello information on what he knows. He brushes his finger with his nose, referring that no knows of Franzo is not part of the indictment. Jimmy Marcello questions that. He's quite surprised. Now he's starting to think that the Franzo was an informant. He also rubs his belly when he's referring to Pudgy Matassa. They talk about the truck driver, Mikey Sarno, and they talk about the babysitter. That was uh, Federal Marshal John Ambrose. And this guy was a high-ranking Federal uh, Marshal. He, uh, they televised a couple of his major drug busts really boosting his career. However, his father was a mobbed up cop that got pinched years ago for police corruption, in Chicago police department. So they knew some of the Chicago outfit guys and Jimmy Marcello and Mikey Marcello are talking in code on how they're going to get to this guy, Ambrose to bribe him. John Ambrose was one of the FBI agents that was watching over Nick Calabrese during the family secret investigation and trial. He was part of the security. So the outfit was trying to bribe John Ambrose, who most likely would have took that bribe. The government also alleges that the biggest threats to Nick Calabrese, if they were able to get to him, were these men here, Mike Sarno and Sally Cards. This guy here we'll call AB was a serious threat that was trying to get to Nick Calabrese. This guy here, Tony Zizzo, made member of Chicago outfit. I seen him in court during the uh, Sam Carlisi trial. He was a big-time threat to Nick Calabrese as well. He was one of the men out on the street that if they would have, if John Ambrose would have leaked the information on where to get to Nick Calabrese, he would have been one of the men involved. You can just imagine what they would have did to Nick Calabrese if they found him. However, though, this guy was last seen. He dropped off his car at a great neighborhood, a restaurant in Melrose Park called Ambrusos. He had a meeting downtown at Rush Street, right there in the Viagra Triangle. And Little Toe Zizzo never made it to that meeting. Till this day, he is MIA. I think there's a $10,000 reward if anybody has any information on Anthony Little Toe Zizzo. But when Zizzo, when Jimmy Marcello went to prison, he not only lost a good friend, but he lost his protector. He was uh, Jimmy Marcello's number two man in the pecking order. But he had beef with Sarno and some of the other guys. There was kind of like a power shift. Until this day, this guy is MIA. I think he lammed it. He didn't want to go to prison like Jimmy Marcello did at the Family Secret Trial. But most people think he's a victim of the Chicago outfit, another unsolved murder. Another guy that was a threat to Nick Calabrese, if they could have got to him, was this guy here. I just did a story on him. John Pudgy Matassa, made member of the Chicago Outfit, big-time union guy. I seen him in 2019 where he pled guilty to embezzlement. He also had his wife. Uh, he got her a job making union scale uh, as a no-show uh, union employee for four years. Um, he actually tried to collect um, 
early benefits. And some of these guys that end up working for McCormick Place or the union, they they get these no show jobs, making union scale. They're not carpenters. They're not they they're not tradesmen. They're not electrician guys. And then after a year or two of working for the union or in McCormick Place or places like McBear, they actually get injured and fucking sue. <laughs> so so imagine that you you have a no show job right, making top wage. You do that for a couple of years, and then you file a false workman's comp claim. Not only were the Chicago Outfit guys doing this, but a lot of their family, friends, and associates as well. They had a beautiful scam going, and some of it is still going on. But let's recap. Ambrose, federal marshal, was assigned to the security of Nick Calabrese. Jimmy Marcello. Boss of Chicago Alpha at the time. Another high-ranking guy, Frankie Caruso. And his own brother, Frank Calabrese, were all trying to get to Nick Calabrese. If they were able to get to now Nick Calabrese, he would have never have testified in court, and there would never have been a family secrets trial. But these were the men... That were the biggest threat to Nikki Calabrese. These two guys here, Solly Cards, Mikey Sarno, this guy here. Zizzo we talked about who went missing. And last but not least, Pudgy. So to wrap it up, Mikey Marcello, Jimmy Marcello here. Jimmy Marcello gave the green light to have Nick Calabrese killed to keep him from cooperating. Nobody did more damage to the Chicago outfit than Nick Calabrese. He admitted on the stand that he was a coward. He showed absolutely no remorse. A lot of people didn't believe his testimony, but I seen him in court every day. I heard every word of his testimony. I saw his demeanor. And for the most part, I found him credible with maybe a couple few white lies that he told. He kind of flipped and flopped about Jimmy Marcello. He also thought he saw Rocky and Felice at the house in Bensonville when the government had Rocky and Felice under surveillance somewhere else. So there's a couple white lies, but overall, Nick Calabrese came along credible. Um, but this is a very dangerous man here. And the judge and the prosecutor for his cooperation only gave him a few years in prison. So he did like four years in prison with time served and good behavior for 14 murders he participated in. They also paid uh, $30,000, $40,000 for his dental work. They paid for his living expenses. He was getting weekly checks. But he's so lucky because John Ambrose, if they would have got to him and bribed him, these guys that I just mentioned, one of them, if not all of them, would have took care of Nick Calabrese. That's it, though. That's uh, um, a big-time contract that never got carried out. But don't let the Chicago outfit fool you. They'll, they're still very capable, very powerful, even though they lost a lot of their men. Most of them have went legit, the smarter ones. And the real guys are all locked up or have died. A lot of people don't realize how close Nick Calabrese came to getting killed before he testified to Family Secret Trial. If you like my Chicago Mob Trials stories, hit the like button, subscribe, share with your friends. Hope everybody has a great weekend. Ciao.